in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Doing another show for today on the topic of the Magisterium, my favorite topic, topic that I am writing my doctoral dissertation on, the Magisterium of the Catholic Church, that is teaching authority in the church. So ask me any questions related to Catholic teaching authority. That is the Magisterium. Make sure to put it in the chat to at reason and theology. I'll do my best to get to the question and answer it the best that I can. Uh, just a couple um, before I take questions, let me just give a few book recommends. Some people have asked for book recommendations, of course. Oh, why didn't I grab it? Oh, it's over there. Never mind. Um, Jimmy Aiken's book on teaching with authority. Um, let's see. Yeah, teaching with authority. That one's really, really good. It's a page turner. It's really thick, but you'll read it very quickly because, like I said, it's a page turner. It's very, it's written very, very well. Very interesting. Start out with that for an introduction to teaching authority in the Catholic Church. It covers all bases for an introduction. Another good introduction is, is of course, the classic by Cardinal Avery Dulles, the Magisterium, Teacher and Guardian of the Faith. Also, a really good introduction. Uh, after that, you're going to want to get Creative Fidelity by Father Francis Sullivan. It's called Weighing and Interpreting Documents of the Magisterium. It's more advanced. It's more in-depth. It's going to deal with engaging actual magisterial documents, how to properly weigh them, and some other more advanced aspects of the magisterium beyond a basic understanding. You'll want to get this book, this is the dissertation of Dr. John Joy on the Ordinary and Extraordinary Magisterium from Cloyton to the Second Vatican Council. It's a good survey of the magisterium uh, from the 19th century unto the present because we've had to focus a lot more on teaching authority, especially non-definitive teachings from that time since there has been Prior to then, we didn't have to deal a whole lot with the issue in the concept of non-definitive teachings because popes weren't writing encyclicals a whole lot. Uh, people had to conserve paper <laughs> for the majority of history. Uh, so popes generally didn't talk or speak or teach unless it was something that was really, um, you know, weighty. Uh, but of course, circumstances changed in the 19th century with papal encyclicals and a little bit before that. Um, but especially in the 1800s, 1700s, 1800s, with more lengthy papal encyclicals. So there's some developments that have come about in that period of time that you'll want to be aware of, and he surveys them. Um, obviously, there's also Francis Sullivan's work, The Magisterium, Teaching Authority in the Catholic Church. It's meh. It's meh. Uh, my dissertation is specifically on magisterial reversals in the thought of Francis Sullivan. So he's he's a fascinating figure. He's a force to be reckoned with in the 20th century. Passed away just a few years ago, I believe. Uh, I want to say 2018, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but monumental figure in magisterial studies, even if we don't always agree with everything he says. Again, a force to be reckoned with. But I'm not a big fan of his book. The Magisterium, I'm much more a fan of Creative Fidelity, although I don't agree with everything in it. Richard Gaillardi, um, I don't agree with everything from Richard Gaillardi, but um, forced to be reckoned with, forced to be reckoned with. This one deals with the ordinary and universal Magisterium in much more detail than anything else. It's called Witnesses to the Faith. It's not the only book he's written. Uh, he also has some introductory material. This is not introductory material. This is a little bit more more advanced, but it deals with the ordinary and universal magisterium. Um, this one is good, but hard to get a hold of. But I did find an older version of it online for free. It's Francis Morrissey, Papal and Curial Pronouncements, Their Canonical Significance in the Light of Code of Canon Law. He deals with the level of different magisterial documents as far as how weighty they are, as far as documents, in fair detail. Not exhaustive detail, but fair detail. That's helpful. His focus is more from the Code of Canon Law, so it's from more of a juridical perspective. Uh, but he does touch on issues related to the magisterium and how authoritative in teaching a particular document might be in comparison to another document by the magisterium with all other things being equal. 
it's more complicated than that, obviously, but it's helpful, helpful primer there. This one's very hard to get a hold of. I had to um, order this dissertation from Switzerland. Uh, I Good luck finding one. Good luck. But if you're really wanting to dive deep, you're going to want this, but it's going to be very difficult to find it. So some people are saying, well, why are you recommending it? Because it's so important in this area. If you want to dive deep, it's on theological censors. It's his dissertation, the development of the theological censors after the Council of Trent. If you want to know more about the theological censors, most theologians are going to rely on this. He surveys the theological censors from the time of the Council of Trent unto the present. And the theological censors were really first used at the Council of Constance right before the Council of Trent. So he's pretty much surveying the history of the theological censors, period. And not all theologians used them the same. So he surveys the different ways in which they used them and kind of gives you a general consensus among them. Very, very advanced. So this is not necessarily introductory material, but it's very important if you're wanting to dive deep into the issue of theological censors. Uh, if you want to deal with um, magisterial reversals, uh, theoretically and perhaps practically, you're going to want to get this one. The Disputed Teachings of Vatican II, Continuity and Reversal in Catholic Doctrine by Thomas Guarino. To date, this is the best thing that's out there next to Dr. King, um, Lawrence King's dissertation, and I've had him on my show before, his dissertation dealing with the authoritative weight of non-definitive magisterial teachings. That also engages it maybe in a little bit more detail in some areas, and this engages that aspect, I mean, that topic in some other areas in more detail. This is a little bit more accessible, although Dr. King's dissertation is available online for free. I've also had him on the show before, so go and watch that interview. Uh, you could also get my um, course on the Magisterium where I break a lot of it down. It's called Understanding the Magisterium, MaximusInstitute.com, uh, where I give a course on teaching authority in the Catholic Church. This one's awesome, though. This is directly relevant to my dissertation because, again, my dissertation is on still being written. It's on... Um, magisterial reversals and reversals in Catholic teaching um, in the in the thought of Francis Sullivan. So, um, which you might sound, you might say, oh, that just sounds really niche. Not really. It has impact and application on almost everything that we talk about uh, in Catholicism and apologetics. <sighs> But I'll explain that in further detail in the future. I just wanted to give you all a couple books there to consider for teaching authority. That's clearly not an exhaustive list of books. It's just a few. Uh, let's look through the chat and see what we have. Mm. Michael, you should change your title to Ask Me Anything About the Magisterium. I have all the answers. <laughs> I don't have all the answers. I definitely don't. Um, there's, there's certainly some questions that deserve further research. So definitely don't have all the answers. Um, how long can the time gap between ecumenical councils be? Is it required for the church to have a council every four centuries or so? It is not, and there is no time gap. However, we could speak about matters of prudence here. I mean, is, is it a good idea to go four centuries without an ecumenical council? Probably not. Um, I know we went from Trent uh, until Vatican I without one, but it's partly because Trent was so good as an ecumenical council that it was partly not needed to have another one until Vatican I. Um, there's some truth to that. Uh, Trent was very effective, very effective. Uh, but no, there's no time period. Um Christ never said, here's how often you have to teach definitively as far as the College of Bishops. I just didn't. <laughs> it's a matter of prudence. It's a good question, though. Great question. Um, very good. Um, since Jimmy Aiken is the only writer on systematic writer on aliens, which I think you might be right there. By the way, he has some awesome stuff on aliens and ghosts on mystery. Aiken's Mysterious World, Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World, which you need to go and sub to if you're not already subbed. It's, I love that podcast. It's awesome. 
Does this mean that in the absence of anything from the magisterium that we must listen to him as authoritative or important? <laughs> Wesley asks the question. Look, I mean, fact of the matter is Jimmy Aiken's pretty well-rounded. Um, you might not agree with everything he has to say, and he would tell you, I'm sure he would tell you, that's fine. You don't have to agree with everything I have to say. But you have to recognize he's a force to be reckoned with. He's a force to be reckoned with. Um, so you you really do want to consider what he has to say. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to agree with him on everything. But you shouldn't easily dismiss him is, is going to be my opinion. I don't easily dismiss him. I've, I, I've, I've enjoyed Jimmy Aiken's material from back in uh, ever since 2012. Actually, 2011, before my conversion to the Catholic Church, I've been reading Jimmy Aiken and listening to his content, really helpful, well-rounded. Like I said, as far as an introduction, I'll point you to his introductory work on, on the Magisterium. It's very, very good. As far as an introduction, it's comprehensive for an introduction. It's really, really good. Um, there was some minor points in there that I would probably disagree with as far as, um, I think it was Ordinatio Sacerdotalis and whether or not that's ex cathedra. Just very, very minor stuff that I would take a different position on. But it's it's stuff that it's like, okay, well, so what? You know, um, there's, there's just, again, there, I can't think of a better introduction. I would put his introduction right there next to Dolis. The advantage of Aiken's book compared to Dolis is, look at, look at Dolis's book. Look at Ellis's book. It's kind of thin. And and half of it is an appendix. <laughs> which are which are helpful. At appendix bibliography, you know, stuff like that. So it's actually not as thick as you think. But let me show you Aiken's book. Hold on. One second. Give me one second. Now, here's his book, a lot thicker, and deals with just more issues than Dulles does. That's not a slight against Dulles. Please don't misunderstand me. Dulles, forced to be reckoned with. I, I would put Dulles and um, Sullivan as the top, top guys in the 20th century on the Magisterium. That doesn't mean I agree with everything. I don't. But they're they're the most important. But yeah, to answer your question, no, you, you don't have to agree with them on everything. I, I imagine you asked the question in jest. <laughs> Who's the most underrated pope in your opinion? Hmm. Underrated. These days? Leo the thirteenth, probably. But, I mean, that's just my opinion. Um, let's see. Is the teaching of the nine choir of angels and that of the serpent of Eden is the same as being Satan the dragon definitive? Okay, so... The the nine choirs, from what I recall, comes from Dionysius, pseudo pseudo Dionysius, I should actually say. I don't know if anyone prior to pseudo Dionysius um, really addressed it, although he's rooting it his his understanding in scripture. So you might argue in, from a scriptural basis. Um, but I, I guess the way he details it, the way he ex explains it, is is. Um, I don't know anyone prior to Helm taking that position. That doesn't mean that's not true. Um, Pseudo Dionysius is not, you know, magisterial. I don't think we should easily dismiss him, though. Um, he's certainly revered in our tradition, especially in the East. Um, I'm trying to think if the question of the nine choirs of angels has ever been addressed by the magisterium, and I can't think think where it has it doesn't mean it hasn't there's 2000 years worth of content there um but i'm i can't think of anything offhand but if you find something let me know 
Now, as far as Serpent of Eden being Satan and the dragon, obviously these are references to sacred scripture, but you're asking, are you know, are, is this the proper understanding of scripture? Now, I have seen some things from the magisterium that talk about these things. I'd have to go back and look and see which document they're in and what the level of authority is if you're asking me about definitive. My concern here is not appealing to any particular magisterial document, but I, I would probably argue, isn't the consistent teaching of the ordinary magisterium the case that the serpent in the Garden of Eden would be Satan slash the dragon in the book of Revelation? If, if that's accurate, the ordinary magisterium has uh, put that forward constantly, then that would be considered definitive. But as far as some kind of extraordinary document, um, what does the Confession of Faith from Lateran for say? Confession of Faith, Lateran 4. Mm, all of them will rise with their own bodies, which they now wear so as to receive their, according to their deserts, whether they be good or bad, for the latter perpetual punishment with the devil for former eternal glory with Christ. So they're identifying the devil there with perpetual punishment. And it, it seems that the dragon is also identified with being cast into the lake of fire. So... um. I don't know. I can't think of any extraordinary instances of the extraordinary magisterium here. It doesn't mean that they're not there. It does not mean they're not there. I'm just saying I can't think of any instances. But couldn't we at the very least argue the, the constant teaching of the bishops dispersed throughout the world throughout the ages, the ordinary and universal magisterium? That, that would be definitive if they're constantly teaching it as definitive. Uh, the the difficulty there would be to dis establish that they're teaching it as definitive and not as some lower level of ascent. That's going to be the difficulty with, with that position. Uh, there's a super chat here. Thank you, Patrick. So this isn't the right time for questions on the essence and energies distinction in Thomism. Just kidding. I wanted to support the show in your family. Thank you so much for the super chat. Um, Actually, the essence and energies of Thomism is, is applicable here, but you will I will defer to Father Coppus. Um, Dr. Dr. Goff, Dr. Minard, uh, Dr. Mark Spencer. All of these are individuals that I've had on the show and I've interviewed them on this question. So you're going to need to go and watch them. Um, they're going to deal with questions on whether or not essence and energies and Thomism can be reconciled. But short answer, neither Thomas's view on simplicity nor the essence and energy's distinction, even if we're, if we're going to take the view that they're not reconcilable, um, neither one of those have been proposed definitively in the Catholic Church. So you're free to accept Thomas's view. You're free to accept Palamas's view. You're free to also accept the Scotus view on the issue of the simplicity of God, because all three affirm the simplicity of God, and that's all that the magisterium has defined. So what has been defined, all, th all three of those schools can agree with. The question is some of the specifics on how that simplicity works in relation to creation. Um, those, ha those issues have not been addressed by the magisterium, and that's why you're free to hold to any of those. Thank you for the super chat. Yeah, this is one I've had to address multiple times. It's a fair question. Um, when Donum Veritatis says that the church cannot habitually err, which is a reference in paragraph 24, and matters of prudence, is there any indication of how long habitually is? No. <laughs> no, there's not. Wouldn't have been, would it, it have been very helpful? Yes. Is that better than nothing? Yes. Um. How can I give you how long habitual is? No, 
can I give you how long uh, Vatican I is whenever Vatican I speaks about there will always be perpetual successors? How long can the C be vacant? It doesn't tell you. It just says that there will always be perpetual successors. Um, so there, there's some specific questions there on how long. But I think that we read, reach a point where it becomes obvious what would be habitual. Right, but there there could be some gray areas before it's obvious, you know. <laughs> um, but I don't hinge my arguments that I maintain on the safety of theological. I'm sorry, safety of disciplinary and um, juridical decrees of the church. And in my my what I've expressed here doesn't hinge on how long habitual is. Because somebody might raise that question as if my views hinge there. And I just want to clarify my views, my views does does it hinge on how long habitual is. It hinges on whether or not the Holy Spirit can allow for something unsafe in the universal decrees of the church. Okay, so is canon three of session twenty-two definitive? Let's go to it. Since session 22 on marriage, it's been a while. Let's see. Be off on that. Oh, it's on the mass. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which session is it that's on marriage? I'm uh, now I'm curious. <laughs> I'll answer your question. I'm just trying to see session 24. All right, so we're looking at uh, Canon three. Let's sh let me share it on the screen. All right, share screen. All right, now you asked me about session twenty two of Trent Canon three, whether or not it's definitive. All right, so let's go to Canon three. Uh, well. Hmm. <laughs> I'm spotting something here <laughs> that might answer our question. If anyone saith that the sacrifice of mass is only a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. So this is already on a, a matter of um, faith. This is not a disciplinary canon. Um, this is already a matter of faith and I'm seeing an anathema. So that's going to answer our question, but let's read it. Um, if anyone saith that the sacrifice of the Mass is only a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, or that it is a bare commemoration of the sacrifice consummated on the cross, but not a propitiatory sacrifice, or that it profits him only and receives, and that it ought not to be offered for the living of the dead, pains, satisfactions, and other necessities, let him be anathema. Well, this is the universal magisterium speaking because it's an ecumenical council. It's attaching an anathema on a matter of faith and morals, which means it is exercising the extraordinary magisterium in a canon with an anathema on a matter of faith and morals, which means they think that this is definitive. So they're proposing this definitively. So your question to me was, is it definitive? The answer would be yes. And then your rest of your question is, does it teach a satisfaction theory of atonement since the Eucharist and the sacrifice on the cross are the same? It depends on what we mean by that. And so let's let's do a whole show on the atonement, satisfaction, penal substitutionary atonement. Let's do a whole show on that because it's going to depend on how are we defining those terms. Um, let's see here. Now, obviously, with satisfaction in there, there's going to be a sense in which satisfaction is taught, right? <laughs> but again, it's, it's it's going to hinge on defining terms. It seems like called the communion did an article a long time ago on penal substitutionary atonement and what sense Catholics maintain it. So may, maybe also check that out in the meantime. I'll see if I can organize something specific on it. Um. Does Amorsa Titia in its official interpretation contain error? Contain error. If so, how can it be safe to follow? You're, you're, you're beating me to it. <laughs> I was going to do a show on this. I was actually thinking of doing it today, but I'm not going to do it today. 
but I will be doing it in the near future. I'm going to examine a more satitia. I'm going to go over uh, the interpretation of the Argentinian bishops and Pope Francis's comments on them. And then I'm going to deal with the Council of Trent on this issue related to economia and its canon against the Protestants and Luther on marriage. And, and we're going to examine this um, in detail. So specifics, I'm going to punt on it, but I will just give you a general answer. You ask me, does it have error? Um your question would be, does it have theological air? Um, I would I would have to say from what I've seen, no, properly understood. I could certainly see how somebody would misunderstand it and that might result in air. But properly understood, air, no. Um, might there be some other criticisms of Amor Satizia, though? Might there be some other? How can it be safe to follow? Mm-hmm. This again relates to the issue of can the church promulgate in its teachings or disciplinary decrees that are universal something that is harmful to souls? No. As I've demonstrated um, in a previous video. But that doesn't mean that it's the most prudent or timely, the best way to express it, things like that. But I'm going to have to deal with this in detail. Because there's a lot of ways that we could get turned around and come to some, you know, and and end up getting um, air with some misunderstandings of Amor Satizia. That's certainly possible. Um, what is this? You've spoken before about Dave Verbum being the lens we must view Vatican II through. Does this practice stand for other councils? If so, what are these documents? This is a good question. Okay, so... I didn't say that only about De Verbum. I, I said the major constitutions of Vatican II, and that's not just my view. Um, that's generally accepted. Um, if I recall correctly, wasn't that wasn't that stated somewhere in the Acts of the Council? Or one of the commissions? I'd have to go back and look, but it's certainly not my opinion only. Um, that is, the lower documents of Vatican II need to be interpreted through its major documents, which is kind of common sense, but there's there, there are explicit um, references to this, I think, by Vatican II or some of the figures who are at Vatican II. Um, so Dei Verbum is going to be one of the major documents, but it's, it's not going to be the only one. Um, but for example, I've said that a minor document like Nostra Aetate or Aetate, however you want to pronounce it, whatever. Um, that would be interpreted through Lumen Gentium, not the other way around. And I, I have mentioned that before, and I think that we need to remember that because there's some people who are twisting that document. And they're doing so against Lumen Gentium. And they're trying to say that the Catholic Church teaches heresy because they're twisting it over against what Lumen Gentium tells us. Not to mention twisting it over against what the document itself says. Um, so the distinction between infallibility and indefectibility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's say... Let's uh, let's refer to infallibility, generally speaking, though we could, I'm sure, nuance this further, as not the best way to express something, but something that is free from error. That's going to be infallibility. And it's going to be an organ that is infallible in its teaching authority, an organ like the Pope or an ecumenical council. The organ is infallible. The teaching is not infallible. The teaching as an object is irreformable. Uh, we, so we call the organ infallible, and we call the object of that teaching authority irreformable. So infallibility doesn't refer to the object of the teaching. It refers to the organ teaching. Um, but it means that that organ can teach without error. Indefectible. 
is slightly different. Indefectible would be that it will carry out its mission essentially. Let's, let's define it that way. It'll carry out its mission essentially. Uh, so when we speak of the indefectibility of the church, we're saying the church will carry out its mission in faith. So in, in teachings, governance, and worship, it will carry out the essence of that mission and its functions there. Um, it won't fail in carrying it out. Um, this is why we say, okay, well, if the church imposes something universally that's harmful to souls and its liturgy, it's failing to carry out something essential to uh, the worship of the church, which means that it's failed in its mission. It's defectible. That's one way in which we could understand indefectibility. It's certainly not the on only way, but that would be a distinction between the two. One is without air and one pertains to accomplishing the essence of the mission, which does involve a lack of error in its teaching authority, but it's not limited to just that. Because I could I could see the magisterium failing to teach error, but, error, but then imposing a liturgical discipline universally that's destructive to souls. Well, if it does that, it's defected from the faith, but it didn't teach error. It doesn't have to teach error. It's still destroyed souls. So it still failed in its mission. Um, so there is a distinction there. Um, okay, so what's this one here? A little bit weird, but is the fact that God loves us definitive teaching? Um, okay, so uh, Scripture notes how God loves us. This is mentioned in the Gospels. Uh, and God's love is poured out on the good and the, the bad alike um and also refers to god being love and there has to be an object for that obviously uh in trinitarian theology we would say the ultimate object of that love is going to be uh, within the trinitarian persons but it certainly also then applies uh to god's creation um now um is that definitive well the question here is if some if if scripture explicitly teaches something which I, I think this one is something explicitly taught in scripture um is that definitive is scripture definitive in what it explicitly teaches it's not only definitive in what it explicitly teaches it's also definitive in what it Im implicitly teaches the difficulty with implicit teachings is they're implied so it's going to be you're going to need more of the magisterium to step in, but do you need the magisterium to step in on something that's explicit? No. So those are going to be what we call um, in theology something that is de fide, divina. Um, it's definitive by way of um, the divine, by way of what God has taught explicitly in his word, sacred scripture or tradition. Um that's a little different than de fide, divina et catholica, which is divine and Catholic faith. Um, so that's going to be something that is not only taught explicitly or implicitly in Scripture, so God has proposed it infallibly, but also the church has confirmed that God has proposed it infallibly. Has the church ever solemnly or definitively proposed that God loves us? I can't think of an instance. Why would it have to? It's already, it's already there explicitly in Scripture. So there, there's just no point. And I guess if somebody starts teaching a heresy that God uh, hates us, not in a way that Scripture refers to, such as Psalm five or something, where God hates the sinner, um, but in a way that would be in conflict with the idea that God is love, I guess it would be necessary for the magisterium to intervene then and offer a definition. Um, please explain the objectivity of the Catholic magisterium over and against an orthodox conception of teaching authority as expressed by synods and councils. Well, there is something objective to the orthodox teaching authority when it comes to synods and councils. There is something objective there when it, at least when it comes to lower synods and councils, that is lower than universal synods and councils. 
synods and councils can be used interchangeably, though we could make some distinctions in orthodoxy just depending on what the context is. But um, generally speaking, they're, they're synonymous, though, they're, again, we could make some distinctions here. Um, but something lower than a universal council in orthodoxy, there is something objective there. So the Senate of Bishops, a local council, you know, th those are objectively identifiable in orthodoxy. The problem in orthodoxy is a universal council or a universal synod, same thing. That is not objectively identifiable in orthodoxy, and orthodox theologians generally admit that, such as Florovsky, for example. Um, whereas in the Catholic Church, we can objectively identify them. That doesn't mean we're right, but we can objectively identify them. And that is through papal ratification. Um, so maybe look up the Code of Canon Law, look up the Canon on Ecumenical Councils, and it will tell you what I just said on identifying an ecumenical council. Um, there is something objective to that. That doesn't mean we're right. I mean, I do believe we're right, but there is a difference there between objectively identifying an ecumenical council in Catholicism versus the subjectivity that is there in uh, Eastern Orthodoxy when it comes to universal councils. They don't have an objective way to answer that. Now, their, their argument might be, well, Jesus never gave us something objective. The Holy Spirit doesn't give us something objective. So you Catholics, when you give us this objective definition, it's just not a definition that God has given us. So that's going to be their comeback. So our challenge then is going to be to demonstrate that our understanding of ecumenical councils is something that is part of a divine institution. Generally, the Orthodox are going to think that the universal organ, universal teaching organ, is not something that is part of the essay of the church, the essence of the church, but it's part of the bene essay, the well-being of the church. So it's not something that God has divinely instituted, but it's something that we as the church have come up with because it was helpful to address. Whereas in the Catholic Church, no, we're going to say the universal teaching authority is part of the essay of the church, not just the bene essay. It's part of the essence of the church. It's part of the divine constitution of the church. It's not just part of the well-being of the church. It is something that comes from Christ. It's a good question. Um... Michael, can you please add these books to a list in the show notes or on your website? Yeah, 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 if I remember. <laughs> if not, go back and watch the video, beginning of the video. I'll try to remember. Did I ever find Tanner's um, books on the council? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's two volumes. Um, it's right out of the camera. Uh, let's see what direction. Okay, I'm looking over there. It's right over... You can't see it, but it's on right here. It's over there. <laughs> I have them over there. Yeah, I know because I have to use them pretty often. Um, it's really good. Um, I, I like Tanner, although it's really hard to get a hold of Tanner. Um, and very expensive. I think they're going for 1200 for the two volumes. Um, and they're, they're out of print. But Tanner is good because he has all 21 ecumenical councils translated into English. And then on the other side of the page, he usually has Latin and Greek. If there is a Greek version of the text, he'll have both the Latin and Greek. In some cases, there's only the Latin version available. So he'll only have Latin. It's helpful. Um. Hmm. What is this question? Uh, okay. Is it possible that the magisterium could define and declare on something that we wouldn't normally expect? Like an ecumenical council that defines blue is superior color to red. Okay. So your, your question is, what are the objects of infallibility in the Catholic Church? Um, so the short answer here is there's two objects of infallibility, what we call primary objects and then secondary objects. A primary object is going to be the church is able to define 
anything that is taught by God in Scripture or sacred tradition. That's a primary object. So if God teaches it in Scripture or tradition, the church can define that that is what God teaches in Scripture or tradition. That's a primary object. That's within the scope of, a, of, of authority for infallibility of the church. Uh, secondary objects of infallibility are matters of fact or history that logically or historically are necessary to maintain in order to preserve something that is uh, taught by God in Scripture or tradition. So these are things that God has not revealed in Scripture or tradition, but they are necessary to preserve in order to guard something that is revealed in Scripture. So um, if we were to say, well... Nicaea 1 defined that Jesus is consubstantial with the Father. Well, it defined that as a primary object because it teaches that this is something God has revealed in Scripture. Um, but what if somebody were to come and say, I don't believe Nicaea is an ecumenical council? Well, the church is able to then say definitively, Nicaea is an ecumenical council. Um, that would be what's called the dogmatic fact. It's not something revealed by God. God nowhere nowhere revealed that Nicaea is an ecumenical council. God did not reveal that. Uh, but it is necessary to preserve in order to preserve something that is revealed by God. So, secondary object. That's just one example. Theological conclusions are also secondary objects. So, a theological conclusion, something that is what's called virtually revealed, is also a secondary object. These are going to be things that you take something revealed by God and add an element of something that we know by reason and whatever comes out as a conclusion, that is also an object of infallibility. Let me give you an example. Scripture teaches that God is, that Jesus is fully man, right? Fully God, fully man. Well, Scripture never tells us that Jesus left. Um, but would we not say, according to reason, that the ability to laugh, risibility, the ability to laugh, is something that is part of human nature? If that is something that is part of human nature, risibility, then we would say Jesus had the ability to laugh, and we can know that infallibly. Even though Scripture has never revealed it, we can know Jesus had the ability to laugh because we know he's human. And by reason, we know one of the things of being human, an essence of being human, is risibility. Now, whether or not he exercised risibility is something else. <laughs> but at least the ability to laugh would be something that is an object of infallibility. There's some disputes on whether or not practical applications of the moral law can be objects of infallibility. So some would say uh, the immorality of the use of artificial contraception in marriage. I think Francis Sullivan is going to argue that that's not an object of infallibility. So the church can't, can, it can teach it authoritatively, but not infallibly is what Sullivan's going to argue. Because he's going to say all that's included in the secondary objects of infallibility are the general principles of what's moral, but not specific applications of them. The difficulty with Sullivan in that thesis is going to be, um, it sure does seem that popes have treated specific applications of the moral law as objects of infallibility. So that would be my response to Sullivan. Um, oh, but let me let me also, before I move on, let me... Also clarify that beyond those things, primary objects and secondary objects, there is no more object of infallibility. So your, your specific question that blue is better than red, um, the church could never definitively teach that because there's nothing about the color of blue being superior to red that would be necessary to maintain as far as a proposal to, to maintain something that is revealed by God. There's nothing, there's no necessary relation between those. You can deny that proposition and still maintain everything that's in the deposit of faith. So 
that's beyond the scope of the church's infallibility. So no, it could not say uh, blue is is superior to red. Um, that would be what people would call a tertiary object of infallibility, what some theologians have called a tertiary object of infallibility. And I would say there's no such thing as a tertiary object of infallibility. But those who, who would defend such a thing, which there's no basis for it, um, that's what it would be called. Things that are not necessary to preserve, to preserve something in the deposit of faith that are matters of history or fact. That would be a tertiary object of infallibility. I would say these tertiary objects are not objects of infallibility. The infallibility of the church extends as far as the teaching authority of the church extends, um, but no further than that. And there's nothing about the color blue being superior to red that pertains to teaching authority. So, hmm. Did the magisterium ever teach the distinction between being a member of the soul but not the body of the church in regards to extra ecclesium nulla salus? Um, I would say read, first of all, the Holy Office, where it does go over Pius the Ninth and also Pius XII, that that where they did teach some things that are, that are related to the distinction you raise. Um, it was a document by the Holy Office of 1949 in response to Father Feeney, Feeney and the St. Benedict Center. It should come right up on Google. You'll want to read that. You'll also want to read Lumen Gentium 14, which um, necessitates that distinction. It doesn't use the language of Bellarmine there, the distinction between soul and body, but the concept of what Bellarmine is distinguishing between soul and body is asserted by Lumen Gentium and the conciliar fathers. Again, that language of soul and body, to my knowledge, goes back to Bellarmine. Uh, let me see if I can find the Holy Office. Okay, so it's called Letter from the Holy Office Concerning Father Leonard Feeney. Um, technically, this is not magisterial from what I recall, um, but the documents it cites like Pius the Ninth and Pius the Twelfth are magisterial. If I have the right document pulled up here, I think I do. Yeah, I do. Like Mystici Corporis uh, on the mystical body of Christ is going to be magisterial. Um, but Lumen Gentium is certainly magisterial. So. <laughs> Uh, even, even if you toss this out the window, what do you do with Ovigensium? <laughs> Are you going to just throw away an ecumenical council? Some people do, and that's why they end up set of contests. Um, hmm. What's this question? If the magisterium determines something authoritatively on a matter of discipline and a later council pope rules it heretical, what would that mean for the church, if anything? Okay. So please go and watch the video I did a few days ago. Let me pull it up. Let's see what the title is. I'll answer your question. I just want to give you a further treatment of it, a more in-depth treatment. The video in question is called... Share my screen. Can disciplinary decrees be harmful to souls? You're going to want to watch that video for something more in depth, but a short answer to question. When you say the magisterium, I'm assuming you're referring to the universal magisterium, not to a local bishop in his magisterium, um, or a local synod. Or something like that. I'm assuming you're referring to the universal magistrate. 
In reference to the universal magisterium, that is a pope speaking as the universal shepherd or um, an ecumenical council or the ordinary and, um, and universal magisterium, you say if the magisterium determines something authoritatively on a matter of discipline and a later council rules it heretical, what would that mean for the church? This would be impossible, as I've argued, because the universal magisterium can't authoritatively promulgate a discipline um, in its governance or worship that would be harmful to souls. And you then even say not only harmful to souls, you're now even saying heretical. The universal decrees of the church insofar as they touch on matters of faith and morals would be protected by the Holy Spirit, as I've argued in, again, that video. So it could not do such things, let alone propose a discipline that you call heretical. Moreover, how can a discipline be heretical anyway? I don't think we're using the proper terms here. I understand what you're asking me, but that wouldn't be the proper use of the terms. Disciplines aren't heretical. Teachings are heretical. Um, now, you might say, but there's disciplines that could lead to heresy. I understand that. But it, heresy, uh, uh, as a theological censor, applies to teachings, not disciplines. I would say harmful apply is the theological censor that applies to discipline not not heresy heresy applies again as a theological note a theological censor heresy applies to primary objects of infallibility dogmas um defined dogmas and undefined dogmas heresy would apply to both as a theological note uh Let's see. Look at through the chat. Is the fact that a certain interpretation of scripture was common for a millennia the same as definitive witness? I like this question. Because after Augustine, most see Genesis 6 as not being angels but humans. Ah, ah, two separate issues here. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah first of all i i do take the thesis and i don't think it's defensible otherwise i do take the thesis that genesis 6 is referring to fallen angels i don't think it's tenable to take the human thesis and the lineage of cain and stuff like that and, and of seth and yeah uh, it's, it's, it's an indefensible thesis according to Scripture itself. Scripture itself interprets them as fallen angels. Just read Second Peter and Jude. You can't come away with Augustine's interpretation there. I don't understand why he took that interpretation. So I will fight you tooth and nail that Genesis 6 is not about humans. It is about fallen angels. Um, putting that issue to the side. Your general question about is the fact that a certain interpretation of Scripture was common for a millennium the same as a definitive witness? Not necessarily. There's certainly a relation, but not necessarily. You're going to hear, you, you want to get uh, Emmanuel Duranzo's Channels of Revelation. I know I've mentioned them before. Let me pull it up on the screen. He's not dealing with this in real detail, but he gives you some points that touch on this. Um, here it is. Share my screen. Channels of Revelation, Emmanuel Duranzo. Uh, I don't think I shared my screen yet. Hold on. Let me make sure this is it. Yeah. I just found it on Google. Uh, Channels of Revelation, Emmanuel Duranzo, and uh, here it is. Science of Sacred Theology for Teachers. He's the last of the manualists. 
he wrote in the post conciliar era, right after Vatican II. He's he's a Thomist. He's the last manualist. Some something Father Francis Sullivan was the last manualist. He was the last manualist in Latin who wrote in Latin. Um, Doronzo is the last manualist who wrote in English. Uh, you'll want to read this book. It's a short read, and it is a page turner, eighty-five pages. It's going to grapple with some questions related to what you're asking me. So you're going to want to check that out. Um, let me answer your question, though. A certain interpretation of Scripture that's common for a millennia, is that definitive? No. No, not necessarily. But what could be a reliable witness to what's definitive is the constant teaching of the theologians, as Pius IX puts it, because that's the way he defines ordinary magisterium, oddly enough, not the constant teaching of bishops, but the constant teaching of theologians. There's certainly a shift in that definition by the time we get to Vatican I and uh, then Lumen Gentium, Vatican II. But I think we can still accept what Pius IX is saying there. If the Catholic theologians, that is, ones with mandates, not just someone with a degree, but those who are, you know, sharing in the teaching authority of the their bishop, um, if they're constantly relying or constantly testifying to the truthfulness of a proposition, they're not an organ of the magisterium insofar as they're not an infallible organ of the magisterium. So we're not we're not saying the Catholic theologians there. Pius the Ninth is not saying they're they're like an additional organ of the magisterium that's infallible in addition to the Pope and bishops. But they're reliable witnesses to what is part of sacred tradition, and that's what Doronzo is going to show is when we talk about sacred tradition, how do we know what's part of sacred tradition? Um. Now, have the Catholic theologians constantly and, and universally or unanimously taught that teaching? No. And if it's only for a millennium, can we really say that that's a constant teaching? Not if there's a contrary teaching prior to that. That would be a no. Now, what if there is no indication of what the theologians taught for a whole millennium? And then all of a sudden, bam, in the second millennium, they're all teaching it, and it's constantly being taught by them. But we don't know what they taught in the first millennium. There's no evidence to the contrary. At that point, we could look at something limited as far as one millennia and say, okay, that's a good indication that this is something that was taught even in previous centuries. But if there's evidence otherwise, you would say no. I hope that answers your question clearly. Um, hmm. what's the coolest papal name in your opinion? Innocent Pope Innocent, <laughs> or maybe Pious. I like I like that name. <laughs> the Innocents and the Piouses. Uh. I wish there was a Pope Seraphim. That would that'd be the coolest name. That's my uh, that's my my name. Uh not not given name, but um the name I received uh with my chrismation. And um I like that name, Seraphim. Of course it's it's in reference to the Old Testament angels. Um Book of Isaiah, I believe. Chapter 6, I want to say. What is a manualist? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, I, I'm not laughing at your question. I'm laughing at the fact that it's hard to define some of these things. <laughs> it, it is a little hard to define something like, okay, what's a manualist? Okay. Um, the best way that I can define this, and you might push back on my definition, but... A manualist is going to be those who write in the scholastic tradition a manual of theology. 
that's the best definition I can give you. Maybe it's not sufficient, <laughs> but that's how I would define a manualist. It's a little hard to define some of these things. Uh, <sighs> hmm. Yeah, Wesley, you're asking good questions. So if a certain interpretation was taught for almost two millennia, uh, but now isn't. I think millennia is, is the plural and millennium is the singular. I think I said millennia earlier in the context of the singular. I apologize for my grammatical mistake there. I just realized it. So if a certain interpretation was taught almost two millennia ago, but now isn't, would this be a permissible reversal? Hmm. And wh what do you mean taught? Taught by whom? By, by the theologians? By the magisterium, you might need to clear that, clarify that for me, because um, this could get pretty complex depending on which one we're talking about. Um, this is actually one of the arguments that Sullivan again uses against Humanae Vitae. Now he's in favor of the authoritative teaching of Humanae Vitae. Vitae. He's even in favor of what Humanae Vitae teaches. He's not in favor of the idea that it's infallibly taught. So that's what I'm referring to when I, when I speak of Sullivan. He's going to say it's not infallibly taught. And he's going to say, well, Pius IX, when he's discussing the ordinary and universal magisterium in Tuas Libenter, he refers to the constant teaching of the, not bishops, but Catholic theologians. And he referred to the constant teaching. <laughs> well, the Catholic theologians aren't teaching it today, therefore it's not constant. You see his argument? Okay. Uh, there's there's some pushback that we could offer to that, but, but we'd be here a long time offering that pushback. Was it what was his name who offered some pushback to Sullivan and and some theological journals on that? I've had him on the show. I don't want to mispronounce his name. Um, See, yeah, doc, I, I thought it was Dr. Lawrence w Lawrence Welch, W E L C H. Um, he had a back and forth with Sullivan on issues related to this. Maybe I'll do a stream on it one day. Where do we find the magisterium in scripture? Great. Uh, Aiken deals with a lot of that, actually. Uh, that's going to be chapter... Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. I did a whole show on this. It was on gospel simplicity, where I did a show on it, although I just gave a basic primer. Um. Dr. John Joy on my channel has also done a whole show on this, the Magisterium in Scripture. Go to MaximusInstitute.com, sign up for the free course that you see on there by Dr. John Joy, and it's the first lecture, I believe. First or second lecture by Dr. Joy on MaximusInstitute.com or on my channel. Um, so he's going over this page 21, 22, 23. You know, at the beginning of the book, he's going over biblical support for it. And again, you can go to the um, two videos that are referenced. I mean, obviously, you're going to want to. I did a whole lecture on it uh, and also my course on understanding the magisterium at MaximusInstitute.com. I go over the Old Testament and New Testament roots of the magisterium. It's rooted partly in the Old Testament and Moses and his teaching authority as a judge and teacher over Israel, which continued in succession, uh, whereas it's fulfilled and replaced in Christ and his teaching authority in the New Testament, which is carried on, uh, not replacing Jesus's teaching authority, but acting in his name. It's carried on by the bishops, which continue, I'm sorry, the apostles, Matthew 16, Matthew 18, among other passages that then 
carries on in successors, which we also see testified to in the New Testament as I demonstrate and the lecture and also in the resources that I mentioned to you. Dr. Joy's lecture is free, so you can watch that. My video that I did on gospel simplicity is free. Uh, and I address the perpetuation of the teaching authority of the apostles in the ministry of the bishops. Uh, I, I root that biblically. So you can see that there. <laughs> Pope Seraphim Loftonius. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Uh, are there any pre-schism popes recognized as saints by Eastern Orthodox? Yeah, a ton of them. Uh, just to name a few, Agatho, Leo, Gregory the Great. Um, I got a whole list of them, but I'll, pretty much the same popes that we would consider our saints in the pre-schism era, era uh, they would agree are also saints. Um, the issue of animal immortality is that defend is that taught by the magisterium uh aiken had an episode on it if you saw it i i saw that he did when i didn't get a chance to watch it I, I'm, I'm curious to know what he said i need to go back and watch and i know the thomistic arguments against the uh immortality of animal souls so i'm familiar with their arguments i, I don't know if does aiken take their the thomistic view I, it seems like he doesn't but I could be misrepresenting him. I don't want to misrepresent him. Has the magisterium engaged that one? Not to my knowledge. So this would be a philosophical question to my knowledge. Um, so what's a manual of theology? <laughs> Got to start giving you circular definitions here. Uh, 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 a, 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 a theological document that's written according to the manualist tradition. <laughs> well, it's a manualist tradition. <laughs> I'm going to start giving you circular definitions. A scholastic book of theology. There you go. There's your definition. I'm going to stick with that one. That's that's my working definition for the moment. <laughs> so the clarification is if theologians and bishops and Pope taught it, wait, they're not the same, not the same, not the same. Um, but not definitively. All right. So let me read your question again. Um, so if a certain interpretation was taught by the theologians, bishops, and the Pope, but not definitively for almost two millennia, would this be permissible reversal? Well, If we're <laughs> you threw in you threw in the theologians too there. Um, if the theologians taught something constantly for nineteen hundred years, and how does that even work since we didn't even have theologians attached to bishops in the year three hundred, four hundred? So how does this work for two millennia? I don't I don't know how that works when it doesn't seem that that was the case historically, but. There's some truth to what Sullivan would say by pushback when he's saying, how is that the constant teaching then of the theologians if they've taught it for 1,900 years but not the last 100 years? There's some legitimate pushback that he's offering there. Not not that his conclusions on Humane Vitae follow from that, but I would throw that in. Uh, let's stick to the magisterium <laughs> since that, that less complicates the question. Um if the magisterium constantly taught something but not definitively, is that definitive? Golly. Um, so there's there's a couple ways to answer this. Um, how do you understand Pius the Ninth? Um, when we're talking about the ordinary and universal magisterium, when he speaks about constant teaching, how do you understand constant there? Um and again, it has to be taught as definitive, not as non-definitive. So if they taught it, but non-definitively for a very long time, is that technically reversible? Technically, yes. Yes, technically. 
as far as the proposition, it could be reversed, but what they were teaching wouldn't be harmful to souls, but the proposition technically could be reversed, although it's unlikely that it would be. Um, and again, you're asking me about the context of them teaching something, not even constantly, and then they're teaching it as non-definitive. Well, if they're teaching it as non-definitive, then the answer would be it's possible to reverse it. Um, it's a tough one. A lot of, lot of uh, distinctions to navigate on that one. <laughs> You're giving me a run for my money. Why didn't you super chat that one? <laughs> I gave that one to you for free. <laughs> uh, I'm just picking on you. Um, huh. If the Universal Magisterium, Ecumenical Councils, and the Pope, ex cathedra, mm. Ecumenical Council and the Pope acting ex cathedra is the Universal Magisterium. They're two organs of it. So do you refer, are you referring to the Ordinary and Universal Magisterium? Maybe you're referring to Ordinary and Universal. So let me reread it. If the Ordinary and Universal Magisterium, Ecumenical Councils, and the Pope, ex cathedra, can all make infallible declarations, but the Pope supersedes the other two. Wait, 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 wait. He supersedes the other two. No, no, no. The Pope is part of an ecumenical council. There is no ecumenical council apart from the Pope. Now, I know people talk about imperfect ecumenical councils, but we're talking about definitive bindings, not, not disciplinary cases and extraordinary circumstances we're talking about definitive teaching so there is no ecumenical council apart from a pope so how could a pope supersede a pope that i don't accept your i don't accept the premises in this question when you say he supersedes same for the ordinary and universal magisterium the pope's part of that he's also a bishop um but you ask the pope supersedes the two which i don't accept What's the practical purpose of a council? So the purpose of a council versus an ordinary and universal teaching of the bishops is ordinary and universal is much harder to identify and ecumenical council is much easier to identify. And then what's the purpose of an ecumenical council in light of something ex cathedra by the Pope so that you would get a fuller judgment? That's what Pope Leo says. Um, and uh, I, in fact, I did a video answering this. Seems like maybe a month or two ago. A fuller judgment. You might ask, well, how do you how do you have a fuller judgment of something definitive? Um, not fuller in the sense of being fuller as far as truthfulness, but in the sense of getting people on board behind it, and 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 showing that this is something that the bishops are in agreement with. Not that the Pope's infallible teachings depend on the agreement of the bishops, but it's certainly helpful in showing that this is a manifestation of what every the, the bishops also teach. <laughs> could the Pope make a definitive statement and teaching within a Reddit meme? He could, however, he should not. <laughs> and why do I say he could? Well, Jesus never taught when Peter or his successor has to use the charism of infallibility. He never, that's left for the church to determine. That's left for the Pope to determine. The The Pope doesn't have a specific setting in which he teaches ex cathedra. There, there's never been anything uniform there. Um. An apostolic constitution is something that's often used nowadays, but Pope Leo in his tome didn't use an apostolic constitution. Neither did Agatha or Pope Martin. Um, so what do we do there? Well, there's nothing. There's no particular way. It just needs to meet the criteria given by Vatican I. So if the criteria of Vatican I is met in a Reddit meme, he could do it. <laughs> but it wouldn't make sense for him to do it since nobody's going to read the Reddit meme as ex cathedra. <laughs> um, uh, 
Hmm. Thank you for the super chat. If I give you two dollars, will you tell me the intro song title? I I don't know the song title. <laughs> I'll see if I'm find it for you. Um somebody wants more comedy hour. <laughs> Didn't y'all enjoy the one I did yesterday on what is a woman? Oh, here's an interesting one. Leo the Thirteen's Relement. Does it belong to the Magisterium? Okay. Uh, let's see. Let me see if I can give you an answer right now. Hold on. It's not ringing a bell. Uh, mm hmm. Trying to find it. Do you have a link to it by any chance? Hmm. Find it. Uh, Is it an encyclical? I have um, Leo the Thirteens encyclicals and right behind me, actually. Um, I'd have to look and see, but it only has the encyclicals. If it's an encyclical, the document would be not necessarily everything in the document. Um, I'd have to see what kind of document it is. I haven't been able to find it. Uh, the real amount, i.e. when the Pope asked French Catholics to accept the Republic. I, I need to see the document. Um, again, I tried Googling it. See here. Okay, so is it the document? I guess in French it's a milieu de I don't read French, so <laughs> solicitudes. Is is that the document in question? Um, if so, the encyclical of Pope Leo the Thirteenth on the Church and State in, in France, if that is the document in question, first of all, it's not going to mean that everything in the document is magisterial, and then we could also distinguish between different levels of the magisterium, but let's look at the document together. First of all, it's listed under his encyclicals, so, okay, that's partly answering our question. Assuming this is the document in question, I think it is. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's signing it on in in his pontificate in an encyclical. Um, sure, sounds like his magisterium to me. I, I would say yes. Um, but that doesn't mean everything in it is magisterial. Also, depending on what do you mean by magisterial teaching acts or disciplinary acts, what do you mean by magisterial there? Could be that some of this is disciplinary. could be that some of it is a, a teaching act of the magisterium. We, we'd have to look. He's saying, yep, that's the right document. Okay. Again, I, I need to read through the document to give you more of an answer, but it certainly does seem to be an act of the papal magisterium. Yes, it's an act of the papal magisterium uh, directed to people in the Church of France. To our venerable brothers, archbishops, bishops, clergy, and faithful of France. So somebody might say, well, it's to a limited audience. It's not to the universal church. Right. But the Pope could still teach to a limited audience um, as Pope. Now, it would be binding on those individuals, right? That's the scope of the people that he's binding. In what way is he binding them? In teaching acts, disciplinary acts? I'd have to read through it to find out. Uh, amid the cares of the universal church, we have many times in our pontificate been pleased to testify our affection for France. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to read more to know. So it depends all, also what do you mean by magisterial, but I would say short answer. It's an act, a magisterial act of the Pope to the people of France. 
like I said, I need to look through more to give you something more specific. Somebody said, I feel like Matt Walsh isn't the biggest theological scholar. <laughs> Ah, give him some credit. <laughs> Cut him some slack. Um, let's see. Mm. A pope might find that theology through memes is an effective way to promulgate the faith in a future where rare memes replace human language. <laughs> Maybe in the future I could see it, but not right now. <laughs> uh, memes are usually associated with things that are not solemn in nature, and it's certainly not fitting to solemnly define something in a non-solemn setting. So <laughs> uh, maybe one day memes will be a solemn setting. <laughs> um, uh, is it, wasn't it on a tweet that Pope Francis initiated an indulgence? <laughs> I might have my facts mistaken there, but... Seems a little unfitting. Um, Pope Michael apparently renounced his claim to the papacy on his deathbed. I've heard this, but I've only heard it based on hearsay. Can you give me something substantial to back that up? Something concrete, not just speculative about his obituary and not just hearsay. I'd like something concrete. It might be true if it's hearsay. That speculative analysis of his obituary also may be accurate. It also may not be accurate, and the hearsay may not be true. Is there anything objective to that? I'd like to know. Either way, let's pray for him. Um, okay. Yeah, more comedy hours. Right. All right, soon. We'll see. <laughs> Appreciate y'all watching. Hope this was helpful to y'all. We'll, like I said, we'll occasionally continue to do these. Hope they're helpful. I want to bring more of an awareness of the magisterium to everybody and how it works uh, so that we're not so easily fooled by people who tell us online, this is magisterial and this is what the church teaches. Um, so hopefully these are helping. If you've enjoyed them, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, share it on Twitter, Facebook, and um, other forms of social media. Pass the word. And also, if you want to support me, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. And also, if you want to learn more about the Magisterium by getting my course, uh, it's going to be maximusinstitute.com to get the course Understanding the Magisterium, where I go all over the ins and outs of teaching authority in the Catholic Church. Somebody said, thank you, Pope Seraphim Loftonius I. <laughs> That's hilarious. All right. I'll, I'll see you all later. God bless. Oh, wait, before you go, I would really appreciate it if you would consider supporting this channel. This is my primary means to provide for my family, and it also helps me to produce content like this video. If you would like to support me, become a patron by visiting patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. You'll also get access to extra exclusive content when you become a patron. Lastly, hit that like button and the subscribe button, and be sure to leave a comment down below. God bless.